In this video, we're going to take a look at an alternative method for identifying stereotopic relationships between groups within molecules, one that takes advantage of the so-called symmetry elements of molecules, which include axes of rotation, planes of symmetry, which we have some experience with already, and inversion centers. Like the plane of symmetry method for identifying whether a molecule is chiral or not, the symmetry elements approach can be more efficient in cases where we recognize an element of symmetry within a molecule very quickly. However, the danger is in not identifying an element that actually exists, as we'll see in a bit. Just to give a quick example of this approach, the two hydroxyl groups in this molecule are homotopic. And while we could easily prove this using the Q-test, another way to prove it is to rotate the molecule like so. This rotation leaves the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged. And it also has the effect of exchanging the two hydroxyl groups. For these two reasons, we can consider that axis of rotation, which is somewhere about here, as a symmetry element of the molecule as a whole, and we can consider the hydroxyl groups as having a homotopic relationship. The symmetry element is formally defined as a topological operation that exchanges equivalent groups or atoms such that the appearance of the molecule as a whole is completely unchanged. And this point of being completely unchanged is an important one. The molecule must look exactly like it did before the operation was applied. The reason we care about symmetry elements is that they provide a shortcut for identifying stereotopic relationships, especially in cases when the Q-test is impractical or relatively difficult. The first element we're going to discuss is rotation. And this is movement of the entire molecule about or around an axis. When such, a, when such a rotation leaves the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged, it's considered an element of symmetry or a symmetry element of the molecule. For example, here's the molecule methyl chloride. A rotation about the axis shown here would move the hydrogens in a circle such that they would move into one another's positions after a rotation of 120 degrees. Because the carbon and chlorine are located on the rotational axis, they don't move. And consequently, after a 120 degree rotation, the molecule looks exactly as it did before the rotation. In other words, this axis is a symmetry element of this molecule. Because there are three stops, so to speak, around the rotation, 120, 240, and 360 degrees, all of which leave the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged, this is referred to as a C3 rotational axis. In this case, flipping the molecule over spinning it about the given axis by 180 degrees leads to a final molecule in which things are exactly the same since this oxygen will move into this oxygen, this oxygen will move here, and the CH2 groups will exchange places. Because there are two stops along the rotational axis where the molecule looks equivalent to where we started, 180 degrees and 360 degrees, this is referred to as a C2 rotational axis. As a final example, consider the molecule benzene, which actually has a lot to teach us about symmetry elements. This molecule has an axis of symmetry that runs directly into the screen. That's why I've drawn it with a couple of concentric circles here. Each rotation of this molecule by 60 degrees just moves the carbons and their associated hydrogens around into each other. But the clever might notice that this isn't typically how we draw benzene. We typically draw benzene using a structure that makes its single and double bonds look different. However, the true structure of benzene, namely the resonance hybrid, is a weighted average of its resonance forms. And notice that each bond is double in one structure and single in the other, so the true bond order here is really 1.5. So all six carbon-carbon bonds are equivalent in this molecule. This is why rotation about this axis perpendicular to the screen by 60 degrees amounts to a symmetry element of the benzene molecule. Because there are six stops around this axis that leave the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged, we call this a C6 axis. And just to reiterate, the main point that benzene teaches us is that we need to consider the resonance hybrid when looking for symmetry elements. We need to consider bond lengths and angles by weighting the various important resonance contributors of molecules to which resonance is relevant. For the purpose of identifying stereotopic relationships, we can say that groups exchanged by an axis of symmetry are homotopic. They're in identical spatial environments. The reason for this is that rotation is a physically allowed operation. All three of these molecules are undergoing rotations countless times per second 
just by the virtue of having thermal energy. And so the interconversions of these atoms are happening at a very rapid time scale. They're thus in equivalent environments and they behave identically. This means, for example, that if methyl chloride is going to react with a base involving deprotonation of one of these hydrogens, it doesn't matter which of the three hydrogens we choose to deprotonate, they're all homotopic with respect to each other. In this molecule in the center, if oxygen is going to act as a base in this molecule, it doesn't matter which oxygen we choose, they're homotopic. And finally, for benzene, if benzene is going to act as, say, an electron source through one of its pi bonds, it doesn't matter which carbon we choose to do this, since all six carbons are homotopic. Lastly, this word exchanged, which appears here and for all the other symmetry element tests, is very important to keep in mind. Merely having a rotational axis of symmetry doesn't necessarily mean that a given pair of groups have a homotopic relationship. It's critical that the rotational axis actually exchange the two groups. Consider the molecule shown here, which possesses a C2 axis of rotational symmetry pointing out of the plane of the screen. This axis exchanges this hydroxyl group with this hydroxyl group, and separately exchanges this hydroxyl group with this one. The green hydroxyls have a homotopic relationship with each other, and the blue hydroxyls have a homotopic relationship with each other because they're exchanged by this axis of rotation. However, the green and blue hydroxyls on either side cannot be exchanged by a rotational symmetry axis. Trying to flip the molecule over, say, in this direction to move the green hydroxyl into the blue hydroxyl and vice versa won't work. That's not a symmetry element of the molecule since it swings the hydroxyls pointing back away from us. In order to conclude that a pair of groups are homotopic, they have to be exchanged by the axis of symmetry. In other words, they have to be moved into each other as a result of the symmetry operation. We've already talked a great deal about reflection and discussions of chirality in identifying a plane of symmetry, but keep in mind that we define reflection as the projection of all atoms and bonds in a molecule through a plane and then out the other side of the plane at an equal distance. A so-called plane of symmetry, which is represented using the Greek letter sigma, is a reflection plane that leaves the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged. And we have experience identifying these in identifying whether a molecule is chiral or not. As an example, consider the molecule shown here, which is methylene chloride with one of the hydrogens replaced with deuterium. A plane of symmetry of this molecule includes within it the deuterium, carbon, and hydrogen atoms, and sits right between the two carbon-chlorine bonds so that reflection exchanges the positions of the two carbon-chlorine bonds. Because the hydrogen, carbon, and deuterium are sitting on the plane, they don't move as a result of the reflection, right? Since they're already sitting on the plane, they don't need to be projected any distance to reach it. Keep in mind that the plane of the screen can serve as a plane of symmetry, and that's what's going on in this case. The chlorine, the three carbons of the cyclopropene ring, and the fluorine are all sitting in this plane, the plane of the screen. One hydrogen is above the plane, and one hydrogen is below the plane, and so reflection exchanges the positions of the two hydrogens. One moves from above the plane to below it, and the other moves from below the plane to above it. Finally, the molecule shown here includes a plane of symmetry that contains this carbon as well as both of its hydrogens, which I'll just draw in quickly, and that bisects the carbon-carbon bond in the back. This nitrogen is on one side of the plane, and this nitrogen is on the other, and they're both wedged. So reflection through this plane, which is perpendicular to the screen, exchanges the positions of these two amino groups. The groups that we've identified as being exchanged by these reflection operations, namely the, namely the chlorines in this case, the hydrogens in this case, and the amino groups in the last case, are characterized by an enantiotopic relationship with each other. They are exchanged by a plane of symmetry. The plane of symmetry moves them into each other, and they are not exchanged by an axis of rotation, which would indicate to us that they're homotopic rather than enantiotopic. Groups that are exchanged by a plane of symmetry and not an axis of symmetry are enantiotopic. They're in mirror image environments. This is why reflection converts one into the other reflection converts an object into its mirror image. And this includes an atom or a group within a molecule. Our last element of symmetry is called the inversion center, and this is similar to reflection 
in that it involves projection of all atoms and bonds onto something, but here it's a point rather than a plane. So we project all atoms and bonds onto the point and then send them out the point at an equal distance. When this leaves the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged, the inversion center, which is what we call the point itself, is a symmetry element of the molecule. As an example of a molecule characterized by inversion symmetry, consider the molecule shown here. The inversion center is right at the center of this molecule, and to do the operation of inversion, we move every atom and bond into this center and out the other side at an equal distance. And so in this case, inversion exchanges the two bromines, moving this one into this one and this one up here, including moving the wedged group to a dash, since inversion through a point in the plane of the screen switches the orientation of that bond. And it also moves this hydroxyl group into this hydroxyl group, and vice versa. Groups exchanged by an inversion center of symmetry and not an axis of symmetry are enantiotopic, just as in the case of reflection. And it's actually worth taking a minute to consider why this is. I won't say too much about it other than just to note that the inversion operation is equivalent to reflection through a plane followed by a 180 degree or C2 rotation about an axis perpendicular to that plane. Where the axis and the plane intersect is the inversion center, and doing these two operations is equivalent to doing the inversion. Because a reflection plane is involved in this, the relationship we get is enantiotopic.